Welcome to the Spearhead Podcast. Today we're talking to Chris Bowman, a Buteco breathing expert. If you'd like to contact her, her email address is in the description. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, Tristan? I'm doing really well. Um, my first question is, uh, what makes this breathing technique, Buteco, different from other techniques? Well, the big difference is it's not about deep breathing. That's huge difference. It's the opposite of deep breathing. In fact, I once had a client say it was like having a breathing diet. Um, and so it's not about the deep breaths. It's about establishing healthy, unconscious, um, habitual breathing. And so that's a, the baseline that everybody should operate from. And then from there, you have your different experiences of breathing because your breathing is um, stimulated by the things that go on in your life. So it could be mentally, it could be externally, but your breathing changes. And But what we want is that when nothing's happening, that your breathing is healthy and unconscious and effortless. And so deep breathing is something that people do, particularly when they're really stressed. And there are certain techniques that really emphasize that, where Buteco is about slow, gentle, efficient, matching your metabolic needs with what you're actually doing with your breathing. So your breathing becomes really efficient. And so it's supporting what your body actually needs. And what it does is it resists, resists the emotional uh, input that we experience when we get excited or upset or angry. Our breathing changes dramatically. And so when we know what home base is, we can return to it. We can bring our breathing down by using the technique. So that's the big difference between this technique and others. And then, of course, there's the elements of healthy breathing that we focus on, which is the rate of breathing, whether you use your mouth or your nose, uh, the volume of air that you breathe, the pattern of your breathing, the effort of your breathing, the sound of your breathing. So there's a lot of different elements. So there's no one thing that everybody has that's going on that's that's out of whack. Everybody has something different. Everybody's breathing is a little bit different. And so that's why I work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups is that I tailor what I do to the specific person. And that's really helpful because on YouTube, yes, there's benefit from YouTube videos, but the reality is, is that how you breathe is different than everybody else. And sometimes what you're doing is making things worse, not better. Okay. As I sit there listening to you, I'm now conscious of my breath. Um, and I, I noted you, you mentioned unconscious, which is an interesting take because it's, it's like it switches back between the two. So that's, what's magical. I think about breathing compared to the other uh, systems in our body. It's the only one where we can completely ignore it and it'll do what it needs to do, or we can have complete focus on it and we can manipulate it and change it and then allow it to go back into the unconscious where the other systems in our body that they don't work that way. And it's almost like it's the, the matrix or the center of our external world and our internal world. And so that's the point where it all comes together. And then it uh, moves into the world and it moves into the body, depending. That's an interesting thing. So, yeah. So I can't control my liver consciously at all. It just does what it does. And then breathing is mostly unconscious, but can be conscious. Okay. That's, that's really cool. Um, where did it come from? Where, who, who started Buteco? Well, it's named after the man who um, developed it, Dr. Constantine Buteco. It was after the Second World War. He had been in the war. I've heard two stories. One is that he was a mechanic. One was that he was an engineer. Anyway, he was a man who had a mindset of, you have a problem, let's figure it out. So very analytical. And so he went to medical school after the war. And in those days, particularly in the USSR, they did not have medications. And so then the natural therapies that were out there were still being used a lot. And what happened with him is that he had chronic, serious migraines and what was then called malignant blood pressure, so dangerously high. And he noticed that when his breathing was worse, his headaches were worse. When his breathing was worse, his blood pressure went up higher. So he could see that there's a really clear connection. And so he started experimenting with his breathing for himself. And he uh, was able to figure out how to change it in such a way that the headaches got less and less, started to disappear. 
and the blood pressure started to normalize. And he's like, oh, this is pretty cool. And so in his medical studies, he would ask all of his professors, you know, how does this relate to breathing? How does that relate to breathing? And sometimes they had interesting answers and sometimes they did not. And he was so interested in this that when he had his final uh, project, if you will, before he graduated, it was to observe the breathing patterns of people who were dying in the hospital. They didn't have hospice. And so he would just go to the wing where these people were and he clocked in 600 hours of observation. And what he saw was back to what I said about at the beginning was that people were taking deep breaths the closer and closer they got to death and their breathing became very erratic. They would take little breaths, they would gasp, they would stop breathing entirely and they go back to breathing. And so he thought to himself, okay, if this is what unhealthy breathing looks like because you're nearly dead, then what does healthy breathing look like? So he started looking at other populations in the hospital, like young men who had broken their leg or something, and he was looking at their breathing. And so he was making that analysis. I mean, a big one in terms of being almost dead is that people will switch to mouth breathing. Even people who have been nose breathers their whole life, as they're dying, they will switch to mouth breathing. And that's been my own experience when I've been with people who were, were dying. And so um, I saw it myself about three days before a friend was dying, she switched from nose breathing to mouth breathing and her breathing started to become erratic. And her sister, a couple of days later, was um, heading out for dinner. We were spelling each other off and I just saw changes in her breathing again for the worse. You know, those big breaths, stopping breathing, you know, and the mouth wide open at that point. And I said, don't go, stay. It's going to be really soon. And it was. It was within an hour that the person died. Because people often say, well, just take a deep breath. Yes. So yes. that's maybe not the best advice? Well, it's interesting because it's like people are in the right direction, but they, they kind of have the wrong end of the stick. What you want is to slow down your breathing, to regain control of your breathing. And if you do that by nose breathing instead of mouth breathing, then that shifts everything. It moves you down from the sympathetic state down into the parasympathetic state. And more recent research is showing that it's the exhale that's really important. So if you think of when you've had a really hard day and you flop down on the couch and you do a big sigh, it's, it's all about the exhale, right? But when we're anxious, we're mm. all inhale, right? And so what they're finding now is that the inhale is triggering the sympathetic state and the exhale is triggering the parasympathetic state. So if you're extending the exhale, if you're controlling that exhale, what's happening is that everything is calming down. So it's like people are in the right ballpark, but not quite there. And so the more people do deep breathing, the more they have to do deep breathing. And they find that they're sighing a lot more or yawning a lot more. And that's actually not what you want because it's, re it's really disrupting your breathing pattern. Got it. Got it. So back to the theory, we want to focus on the nose all yes. the time. Yeah, I, that's a really important piece. Um, I, I will say that I have worked with people who have broken their nose multiple times, like hockey players, and I'll get back to the, that in a minute. But the nose breathing is really fundamental to the Buteco breathing technique in that when you nose breathe, you're more likely to use your diaphragm to breathe. They are kind of partners. Well, when you mouth breathe, you're more likely to use your chest muscles to breathe. So that's kind of one of the first things is that we're looking at biomechanics and that the biomechanics are off when you're chest breathing, because then the action is up down. And whenever I work with small children in particular, and I start off with saying, take a deep breath through the mouth and it's all mm. like that. And that's not what we want. We want horizontal action, which is what happens when you use the diaphragm. So you get this movement that's going this way. I've had a couple of times when I've been to the doctor and they've said, all right, take, take a deep breath. And I do through my nose. And there's this hesitation because they can't feel my chest moving up and down it, but they can hear it. Right. And so it's kind of fun that way. But the diaphragm is your primary muscle of respiration. It's huge. It's strong. It's 24, 700 year muscle where your intercostal muscles are auxiliary and you use them when you need more air. And so that's one of the key pieces is efficient use of your muscles, the biomechanics of what we're doing. So the other things about the nose breathing, some people are aware 
of the filter that is created with the, the tiny hairs in your nose so that allergens, for example, have more difficulty getting in. You have the mucous membrane, which catches the debris that does get in. You also have an antibacterial agent in the membrane and that, za that zaps germs which are coming in. So if like during COVID, for example, I was telling all my clients, make sure your nose breathing wherever you go, because that's the sentinel. That's what is protecting you and sterilizing that air as it comes in. And living in a northern climate, you know what it's like as a skier, that if you're breathing through your mouth and it's minus 20 out there, your lungs are not happy. They, they really hurt. And sometimes people get um, really dry throat and mouth when, when they're outside because what's not happening is the nose is not able to warm up the air, right? Because you're not using it. You're using your mouth. And so warming up the air, humidifying the air, cleaning the air, all of those things are really, really important. And the other thing is that it um, is very good in terms of sleep. So if you're nose breathing during the day, that habit, back to the habit again, and then you're nose breathing at night, the chances of you storing are far less than if you're a mouth breather during the day. Chances are you're a mouth breather at night. And so people wake up in the morning, they have headaches, they have a dry mouth. Um, they've had disrupted sleep, then the quality of their sleep is poor. All of that is related to their breathing. And so the nose breathing is key. Uh, if you've read the book by James Nestor, Breath, there's a whole okay. thing, right? A whole thing about him blocking up his nose and he can only breathe through his mouth. And this man is really sick in a very short period of time. It was kind of shocking, actually. I can't believe he did it, but it was pretty interesting to read. Okay. Yeah. I, I was recommended that book. Uh, so I was going to ask you about it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it covers, does it cover the Buteco side of things? It does. I was really pleased with it because he's really accurate. He, um, he represents Buteco very well, which is not what I can say about a lot of uh, coverage that I've seen in the past. And so that was really cool. And uh, the other thing too, which is related to that end media is the taping of the mouth, which is a Buteco thing from way back. It's not a recent biohack, it goes way back. And it's about that whole thing of nose breathing while you're asleep. And so when Dr. Buteco was developing the technique, remember this is the USSR in the fifties and the sixties, pretty different culture than in the West. And so he, pretty brilliant and intimidating person. And so he would say to his patients, every night, every two hours, you wake up and you do breathing exercises so that you will have better quality sleep eventually. And people are like, okay, I will do that. And when it came to the West through Australia, um, Alexander Stelmaski was Dr. Buteko's right-hand man. He spoke English. He had been out of the USSR. And so he went to Australia and started with the Russian community and expanded, expanded into the Australian community more. And he tried to do this. And the Australians, as you might have guessed, just said, in your dreams, am I going to do that? That's stupid. I'm not going to wake myself up every two hours to do breathing exercises. My sleep is already terrible. And so uh, anyway, he was like, hmm, okay. So how can I work around this? Because mouth breathing at night is going to slow people's improvement. It's going to slow changing that habit of breathing to nose breathing. So he came up with taping and it just used paper tape. And initially when people do it, it's vertical, one piece. So you have a little gap on either side. Um, but he also had people taping horizontally um, immediately and the, the media ate it up. You know, this is weird. This is dangerous. Doctors were saying it was dangerous. So it created a brouhaha, but it also created interest in people's breathing. So this is a long time ago. This is 1990. And so it was pretty cool in a weird kind of way where the controversy of it actually got people interested in breathing really in, first time in modern times and um, it works, but you need to be careful. You don't put it on little children and you make sure that when you put the tape on that you have a little tab on the side. So if in your sleep, you need to take it off, you can just take it off easily. That's all that happens. You don't die. You don't smother. You just take it off in your sleep. All right. Okay. Back to your comment about skiing. I was actually up there yesterday. And I had my skis in my back and I was hiking and 
I had real trouble not mouth breathing. Um, I don't know. I mean, I live basically at sea level and then I'm way up a mountain. So there's the, you know, the difference in the air up there and then add the hiking on top. And I just, it, it feels like I'm suffocating or something. Mm -hmm. when I'm doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. When I work with, with athletes, I always say you have to walk before you can run. And um, it's the same thing with, with your breathing. So in that case, what should have happened is that you slowed down and taken more breaks um, rather than try to push through and feel that smothering experience, which is really unpleasant and it's sustainable, right? But when it's haphazard, when it's occasional, then it takes longer in terms of that retraining. Okay. But yeah, I've, I've spoken with athletes who've tried to mo nose breathe instead of mouth breathe and they're just like, oh, it's impossible. There's no way I can do it. Well, yeah, you have to start with sitting quietly first. You know, can I nose breathe comfortably just doing nothing? Can I nose breathe comfortably doing my daily thing? Can I nose breathe comfortably walking, walking quickly, walking up a hill, walking upstairs, jogging? So you work your way up. You don't just kind of like just leap into it and expect that your body's going to be okay with that. It's not. It's going to say, what are you doing? Because it's not used to it. Got it. I, I, somebody sent me a picture the other day. It was of, um, it was like a face where mouth breathing versus nose breathing and the development in the jaw. Um, can you, can you say more about that? Oh, that's really interesting because it's the physical manifestation of good breathing or bad breathing. And it's again, a relatively recent, uh, phenomena because as a species we're mouth breathing more and more. So here's the thing is that if you look at like photographs of African um, people from like say the 1920s, they have amazing faces, they have amazing teeth, they're straight and their faces are, are much more horizontal. And our faces as well, our as in modern day, are becoming very long and narrow and people have all kinds of upper airway issues and teeth issues. So where this comes from, is that your tongue pound for pound is the strongest muscle in your body. If you're a guy for a woman, it's the uterus. That's number one. Tongue is number two. So the tongue should live up in your palate and it should have a kind of um, pressure that is horizontal. And so then your cheek muscles also has pressure that is horizontal going outside in the tongue is going inside out, but the tongue is stronger. So the tongue over time is stretching your jaw this way. And so little babies, for example, that are breastfed more than bottle fed when they're breastfed, what happens is that tongue has to go up and into the palate in order to squeeze the breasts and the nipple to get the milk out. So it is strengthening their tongue every time they drink. And so with that and that develop that horizontal development, what happens is that you end up with a U shape, uh, jaw up and down and instead of a, a V shape up and down when you're a mouth breather, because when the tongue is no longer up there, then there's no resistance, right? The cheek muscles are pushing. So what happens with the, the palate is that it becomes, well, if, if this is the palate and it becomes more like this over time. So the palate is the floor of your nose. So if it's no longer shallow and if it's more pointed, then what's happening with the development of your upper face is that it's changing because it doesn't have that stability. And so what happens is that you get this narrow uh, jaw, top and bottom. So then your teeth don't have any space. So that was the thing for me as a kid, I had really crooked teeth because I was a mouth breather from a really young age. And I'm like, why are, why is my mouth not big enough for my teeth? Or why are my teeth too big for my mouth? It, it never made sense to me. And I was very, you know, self-conscious about it. And that's what it was, is that that very narrowing of the top and lower jaw is what's causing issues. Because then what happens is the lower jaw moves back into the airway. So the right. airway gets smaller. And so when the airway gets smaller, then it affects your posture because you have to breathe. So then you start to get this where people lift their, their chin so they can open up their airway more. And so when you have that posture change, 
then that's affecting all the muscles that you use to breathe with. It just goes from one thing to the next. It just cascades right down. Absolutely it does. So a big part of sleep apnea in kids is that they are discovering that yes, obesity will cause will contribute to sleep apnea, but sleep apnea also contributes to obesity because it disrupts the, the uh, metabolism. And so then uh, kids' ability to uh, self-regulate in terms of food disappears. And so it's like this back and forth that goes on. So kids that aren't getting good quality sleep are being diagnosed as ADHD because they show up not as tired, they show up as hyperactive. Where adults, when they have poor quality sleep, or you know, they're passed out wherever it may be. So yeah, that whole side of things is really interesting. And the dental community is very supportive of Buteco because they get it. They see the results of mouth breathing all the time. And the other thing that's really cool is that even if I'm working with a kid who's of 10 or 11 or even 12, but before they've done the, the braces thing, is that when you can train, again, back to habits, when you can train someone to live, have their tongue live on the roof of their mouth, breathe through their nose all the time, they're still young enough, that jaw is going to change shape. It's very cool. And so what happens? Change shape, it becomes shallower and wider, and the teeth have room to straighten up. So they don't need braces. Mm. And so that's a real motivation for the kid and for the parent when that possibility of 10 or 15 grand not having to be spent on on straightening the teeth is really really important and the other piece is is that the braces straighten the teeth they don't straighten the jaw right. so what often happens the and this is part of the whole package when kids get their orthodontic work done is that there's remedial work afterwards they've taken off the braces they look perfect and then they start moving back Right. And so then they have to have braces again two years later. Because for, it just isn't while. the space in the mouth for all the teeth. That's right. And the, the teeth aren't going to bend. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's all cosmetic. You know, they're not dealing with the structure of of the face, the structure of the jaw. So it's all it's all very much connected. And as I said, it's pretty interesting that piece of Buteco, because you can see the results. Whereas with breathing, you can see the results as an individual, symptoms disappear, quality of energy increases, all of those things. But for other people to see it, they don't really see it unless you have really bad breathing and you're wheezing all the time and coughing. So yeah, it's a really neat part of Buteco that I really love. I love working with kids for that reason because we're looking forward to having a much better state of health because of changing the breathing. Okay. Um, we were going to go back to something about hockey players with broken noses. <laughs> yes. Um, the first time I worked with somebody who absolutely will never breathe through their nose, I was like, oh, can I do this? Because that's such an important piece of Buteco. And so, of course you can, because there's the rate of breathing, for example. So if someone is breathing 20 breaths per minute or 30 breaths per minute, that is way too fast. It should be 8 to 12 breaths per minute. Well, you can be a mouth breather and slow down your breathing. It's harder, but you can still do it. And so that's one place I start and the volume of air that people are breathing. And so wanting to bring that down so that you're not breathing in excess of what you need. It's, it is like a breathing diet in a way, because when you are breathing in more air than you actually need, it's a waste of energy and it disrupts um, the balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we look at the volume of air and then pattern, right? If people's breathing is erratic, they cough a lot, they yawn a lot, they sigh a lot, they hold their breath, all of those disrupt your breathing pattern. And so these are the, all the things that you look at in terms of um, helping people with their breathing. So even if you can't breathe through your nose, there's lots to be done. And un unless there's a structural issue, I can always get people to breathe through their nose. Okay. Sometimes it takes longer than others, but it can always happen. And I've worked with people who've had sinusitis for like 10 years and huge inflammation and huge mucus production and um, mucus that's been there for a really long time that's impacted um, can still do it. It's possible. 
Cool. So how can people contact you? Uh, breathinglady at gmail.com. Very, okay. very easy. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, fascinating, fascinating topic. And uh, I hope to hear more soon. Excellent. Thanks so much, Tristan.